Hello and welcome back to um, the Quagmire. It's been a while, hasn't it? Like in this episode, um, we have um, Sam on and we are going to talk about um, Friedrich Nietzsche. So introduce yourself. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Sam. I'm a second year student at MMU at the minute. I'm, I'm repping years as well. Um, Big ups. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a second year philosophy student and I've been invited onto this podcast to share my expertise on Nietzsche. So I'm looking forward to it. So you, um, you just read an essay on Nietzsche. What's that? You just found it in an essay on Nietzsche. Just um, I've actually asked for an extension on it, which fortunately I've been granted, but I'm writing an, an essay on Nietzsche at the minute, yeah. So it's very fresh in my mind, the content that I'm covering. Um, what's it touching on? Like what kind of, um, <clears throat> what kind of angle are you looking at Nietzsche from? Um, it's an interesting one, actually. Do you mean particularly in this essay or just overall? Um, it can be both. Like, it can be both in this essay and just overall. Well, well, in the essay specifically, I'm talking about the death of God. Mm -hmm. And I'm basically talking about how in the absence of a fixed world narrative or a, what he refers to as a subspecies eternity, which means, I think that's right, right to pronounce it, which means uh, from the perspective of eternity, in the absence of this you're basically left with no shared meaning for the individual. So the question then is, what do we do from this point onwards? How do we live a life without this universal shared common ground that we, we previously had through things like God and even things such as science and metaphysics, that sort of thing, those, those ground existence in something common. But um, I think I've, Nietzsche is probably my favorite philosopher because... One of the things that's different with Nietzsche from other philosophers is his literary style. He writes in a very just interesting way. You don't really get that with a lot of other philosophers. Sometimes it's, it's a lot of philosophy texts that you engage with can be very dry and very sort of like, right, I'm telling you what this thing is and that's all there is to it. And it's kind of like, you know, where's, where's the fun in that? Isn't it quite poetic? Like, isn't it more like poetry in a way? Yeah, particularly... The, the first one, the first book I read by him was uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which was mm -hmm. kind of a silly decision because it's very difficult to understand. And a lot of it is actually like poetry, like poetic texts. But it's it's I've heard before with Thus Spoke Zarathustra, if you if you've read everything else by Nietzsche, then you read Thus Spoke Zarathustra and it all clicks into like this kind of unbelievable masterpiece. It's interesting that this podcast ties in with one we did previously with Dom Kelly, where he was talking about um, a book that he was writing about Heidegger and mm. how Heidegger responded to the problem of nihilism. And mm. so, the, so the answer that Heidegger gives, I think, is that we need some kind of great piece of art that will allow us to recontextualize our lives in the context of this art. So like you gave the example of the Greeks, how the Greeks raised the, a temple and that temple, that great art allowed them to recontextualize themselves in relation to being. So like what, so could you give Nietzsche's response to nihilism? Because Nietzsche identifies this problem nihilism. So what's mm -hmm. Nietzsche's response? What's his answer? Well, I think for Nietzsche is he tries to recontextualize meaning for the individual because it can only exist for the individual only, I think. So I think his overall philosophical goal is to, it's almost to liberate the individual by trying to almost put them on the same playing field as god i don't know whether that's exactly how he would word it, but his point is that because we don't have god anymore we we have to fill that void through through our own determination effectively so that's why when he's talking about things such as morality he's essentially saying what these moral what these what morality has been in the past has been something which has effectively constrained us into a particular mindset. It's something that has limited the individual in relation to something that exists other than us. But obviously, without without this universal shared meaning, which gives morality to the human being, the goal then is to effectively say to the human being, you can create meaning for yourself. You can transcend morality through your own determination. I think, because I know Nietzsche talks a lot about art in his work, and he, he actually thinks of life itself as the, the greatest art. He, he, he referred to Plato as the greatest artist of all time, effectively, because he think, mm -hmm. I think he's basically making the point that 
these meta narratives that you have on reality are effectively an art form. They're like a literary narrative in some sense. I thought that he didn't like Plato because Plato put the idea above life itself. Like Plato elevated abstract ideas above life. Isn't Nietzsche all about how we should get rid of these kind of abstract things that we're evaluating life in terms of and, and stick to life itself kind of thing? Well, yes and no, I think, because I think he, he philosophically disagrees with Plato and I think he thinks basically Plato is responsible for what he refers to in the Twilight of the Idols as the history of an era, which is the era of the true world, as you say. But I think there's still a respect for Plato because he recognizes in Plato that he has effectively created a framework for philosophy to propagate itself through, which is what he effectively sees as, as like an art form. I think, <clears throat> because I think his point effectively is, it comes down to what you call perspectivism, and so for Nietzsche, what he thinks is when you don't have this common ground for humans to kind of, there's no objective standard by which you can measure your life against effectively. In the absence of uh, what you have instead is perspective. So all there is really is perspective on things. So you can take a piece of music and show that to two different people. You can show it to like a, a hardcore reductionist physicist and you can show it to a dancer and they will be able to explain that piece of music in two completely different ways. So the physicist will be able to explain it in terms of vibrating matter, which creates sound waves in your ear. Whereas the dancer will break out into this marvelous dance and sort of experience it or understand it on an emotional level. So, yeah, I mean, I think the thing is he, I think he has respect for Plato, but he also sees in him the fundamental flaw that led to basically all Christian metaphysics. So I was gonna say, Wait, I was about to say about like this um Ubermaker or whatever, this um yeah. person on the level of God or whatever, would that be someone who has been able to accrue a lot of like material like material power, like been able to like rise to the highest ranks in society, or would it be someone uh, who's like super self actualized? I think it would uh, I think it would be a more on self actualization because mm -hmm. I think what his point is is it's effectively saying you can only determine the greatest life for yourself and only yourself can do that. And I think his point is if so effectively, if his, if his goal was that, or if the individual decided that what their life purpose was or what was life affirming for them was to gain material wealth, then the will to power would be the pursuit of gaining material wealth through their own determination. But I think it's 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 not there's no objective way for it to really happen if that makes any sense it's it's something that's brought back to the individual and it's something it's it's i think i referred to it before as a process of ascendancy mm -hmm. so it's basically constantly rising through life through your own will effectively so to what extent is the will to power so the will to power is like a conflict of interpretations of the world so like yeah somewhat yes i think it's basically trying to it's almost like an incrementalist view of trying to incorporate all these different ideas into one, how should we say, I don't want to say one worldview, but it's, it's seeing through them for what they are and being able to integrate that into your own life in order to develop your own meaning for yourself. Because doesn't you just say that the will to power is like some, it's like um, fundamental to reality. So like all there is, is the will to power. Like all there is, is mm. like conflict of forces. Like maybe yeah. That, yeah, no, that's that's a good point as well, because I think what Nietzsche, how Nietzsche regards reality, or at least how the existentialists do, is the idea that reality is basically in a state of flux, and so that all there is is this constant ascendancy from, like, moving forwards throughout life. So I think it's basically almost trying to align yourself with that in a way that means you can effectively create your own life for yourself, how you see fit. So what are you in that context if all there is is flux? Um, well, I guess if you're looking at it from a spiritual perspective, it's you are basically are part of this whole process. The, the funny thing is, I was hoping this could, um, I can talk about this actually, because the interesting thing is when you read Nietzsche is the amount of spiritual parallels that there are with his, his work, which I find really interesting. Because I think the thing is he's writing before a time where 
access to philosophy outside Europe that isn't really bastardized and reduced is is basically like the, 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 I'm trying to think what I was saying. I'm saying um, the time in which he's writing means that he doesn't have access to philosophy outside Europe that much. But I think if we look at it in hindsight now, we can see a lot of parallels between, for example, um, a lot of Eastern spiritual ideas and Nietzsche. I mean, um, I was about to say, I think I heard that Nietzsche was influenced by Schopenhauer, who he himself yeah. was influenced by a lot of Eastern philosophy. So mm. I think that's where a lot of the parallels are just really apparent and stuff. So, yeah, no, definitely. I know because um, even Schopenhauer talks about um, it's because the thing is, I'm on the essay I'm writing at the minute is talking about the relationship between being and becoming, which. Um, it's something that's attributed to Parmenides and Heraclitus because Parmenides regards reality as something that's like uniformly fixed and can't change in any way. Otherwise it wouldn't be that one thing. Whereas Parmenides, sorry, um, Heraclitus regards reality as like I was saying before, like a, like, like a river effectively. Um, but the thing is the relationship actually is a revisionist one because it's Schopenhauer who really di- like extracts this relationship from Plato. Because if you think of Plato, his whole ph- philosophical worldview is effectively that like life is becoming and the true world outside of it is being, which is fixed, which gives rise to meaning within this twilight world of decay. That's that's how he refers to it as. But yeah, yeah, I've heard before Schopenhauer was influenced by um, Eastern religion, but to be fair, I've not read Schopenhauer, so I really wouldn't know too much on that. So where do you see the parallel between Nietzsche and, and Eastern philosophy? Um. I think the biggest one is in how they regard truth or if basically, particularly when Nietzsche's talk about language and how truth is something that's purely linguistic because you can only really express truth through linguistic form. He's effectively saying that what you are saying is never the thing in itself. You can't, it's like, there's no such thing as, as a, a thing that you see and identify with a word. Like for example, like this flask, like we might like see this and think this is a flask, but for Nietzsche, he's like the the amount of metaphorical transfers that have occurred from you seeing this thing and then describing it as what you are means that in between those processes, you've basically distorted what that original thing is to the point where you don't even understand that anymore. But the the kind of central premise of that is that eventually he says that you can never really understand what anything is in of itself. So everything in of itself is just this is completely unique. And I think that bears a lot of similarity to particularly Taoism and Zen Buddhism, because the similarity there is how they say reality is in of itself an illusion. You can never really understand what you are witnessing within your perception. And so for this reason, words in, in themselves are something of, how should we say? Well, like Nietzsche says, it, they're metaphorical in some sense. You can't really ever identify reality with something limited by form. No, like, um, as I say, isn't that, like, the reason why a lot of people consider Nietzsche a nihilist? Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting one, actually, because I think I think the thing with Nietzsche and nihilism is it's not so much that Nietzsche is a nihilist, but more so that he's pointing out a particular zeitgeist of the mm-hmm. time in which he's living. So the thing is with Nietzsche, it's it's... His ideas are revolutionary in some sense, but what he's really doing is he's kind of pointing out the obvious. He's kind of looking at the the trend that's happened throughout history. So, for example, beginning with Plato and the postulation of the other world through to Christianity and God, and then that those ideas start to become diminished to a point where you have Copernicus and the what's it called again? Is it the heliocentric revolution, where the idea that the sun is the center of the solar system then have, yeah. and then you have Kant who comes along and basically says whatever this other world is we we can't say anything about it through his transcendental idealism he gets to a point through a history where he's basically said the meaning that you've created for yourselves is grounded in something that doesn't exist so effectively he's he's almost kind of saying to people who've regarded uh, objective truth or a universal ethic for human beings he's pointing that out and saying this is built on something that doesn't have any grounding so i think the nihilism in nietzsche's philosophy is more so him pointing something out in the time that he lives in and then saying listen this is 
we've kind of got to push past this. We've got to liberate ourselves and enrich ourselves in a way that means we can regard life as something powerful and majestic as opposed to denying the beauty of life in search for something outside of it. You have to affirm the chaos. Yeah, definitely. That I think that's it. I think that's why when he talks about the Apollonian and the Dionysian dichotomy, he sort of sees himself as more Dionysian because Dionysus represents sort of chaos and hedonism of sorts. It's it's a kind of like excitement and a, an indulgence in life and the pleasures in life, whereas Apollonian is more about discipline and rigidity and something about living life according to a particular ethic. You know, I've noticed a really interesting parallel between Nietzsche and Descartes now. Like both Nietzsche and Descartes are considered like skeptics or even mm. like nihilists, but their philosophies were an attempt to combat those two like sw- like schools of thought because they thought those two schools were extremely like prevalent during their time periods. Yeah. I've never, I've never heard Descartes referred to as a, a nihilist. A skeptic. You've, have you heard him referred yeah. to as a skeptic? Yeah, I've heard him referred to as a skeptic. Though I'd actually go so far as to say that maybe not in a traditional sense, but I think Nietzsche was far more skeptical than Descartes. Yeah. Because I think Nietzsche's whole philosophy is basically built around a skepticism of metaphysics or mm-hmm. rationality in some sense his whole f- philosophical worldview is basically composed of saying all these things that we hold in such high value for ourselves what are they mm-hmm. you've never even stopped to think what what you mean by truth when you talk about truth and there's a brilliant passage in beyond good and evil where he's talking about um i'll see if i can find it i can't remember which one it was it might have been 11 where yeah so he's talking about kant and um he says to himself, you know, instead of saying basically, instead of thinking about the Kantian question, how are synthetic judgments a priori possible, we should ask another question, which is why is belief in such judgments necessary? So it's it, that's kind of like, that's a good way to just kind of get at Nietzsche's philosophical goal. It's kind of like what we've built our whole philosophical framework on throughout millennia is something we don't even understand ourselves. So, like, if we go back to this, um, the Dionysian um, attitude of throwing yourself into the chaos and stuff, it's interesting because I wrote, the last essay that I wrote, that I just handed in a few days ago, like, I mentioned Nietzsche quite a bit because it was mm. about, like, um, Leibniz's idea that this is the best of all possible worlds. And the argument that mm. I made was basically that it doesn't really matter whether it is the best of all possible worlds or not, because even if you have that idea that it is, it doesn't really cure the suffering that you have in your in your heart kind of mm. thing. In order to cure that suffering, what you need to do is affirm the world. And so I like brought Nietzsche into it, and I said, like, so I like, and I referenced him saying like the the Dionysian project of like affirming suffering and stuff. And like there was a quote where he said something about like we don't realize how much suffering is constitutive of like the pleasures that we have. Like what was the what was the beauty of the Trojan Wars? It was it was like a, a festival play for the gods or something like that. Mm. Like you affirm suffering and you affirm it as an expression of life and and jump into it. And that ties in with like the eternal return of the same, doesn't it? Because like the eternal return is like by affirming life, you bring life back. Whereas if you deny life and and like um, say like reactive force that denies life and tries to destroy life, destroys life, doesn't it? And it doesn't bring life back. And you have to you have to throw yourself into it to Definitely. initiate this eternal return. Yeah. The eternal return of the same is really a fascinating concept or premise because it's effectively, it's kind of taking the naturalists or the positivists to regard reality as just basically something that's composed of factical existence, like just kind of bodies clashing and having um, cumulative amount of forces exchanged between him. He's taking that idea and taking it to the extreme where he's basically saying like in an infinite amount of time with a limited amount of matter, it ne- like reality will necessarily have to repeat itself over and over. But I like what, yeah, it's, it's interesting what you're saying there about um, throwing yourself into life and not trying to deny it with something more grand than itself because well, for Nietzsche, at least, there is nothing other than that life itself. And I think 
what's what's interesting with Nietzschean philosophy is how he regards suffering as necessary for character growth. So that's one inter- that's one reason why he's so critical of conventional morality or just simply having like good and evil as your com- entire moral framework because to him what that basically is saying is it's limiting life because he thinks that 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 morality in its sense in a sense is how should we say constructed entirely in relation to danger or fear so he thinks basically trying to act in a good way is basically to act in a way that is fearful or scared of life and he thinks that it's it's actually necessary for character growth to go through suffering and to experience danger in order to come out of the other side as a more grand person like there's a lot of self-actualization in Nietzsche I think I mean, I was about to say, surely, though, you can still be self-actualized and act in a good manner, though. Like, so let's say I want to just act in a way that doesn't violate upon anyone else's freedoms or autonomy. So, like, I'm not yeah. I'm not going to go around and, like, beat you up, Sam, for example. Yeah, yeah. But I'm still going to try and, you know, throw myself into situations which may be, like, uncomfortable in an effort to self-actualize. Like, yeah. surely you can have the two positions of there being a conventional morality and self-actualization um well i think so i mean i'm not nietzsche so Uh i'm 100 sure on this but i think his point is not necessarily that it's not that when you get rid of these this conventional dichotomy between (laughs) good and evil that you instantly just become like someone horrible and start killing people and whatnot i think his point is more so that in order to progress intellectually you need that space where Mm -hmm. you do veer between the two in order to understand how to progress forward as a as a human being who exists in this world i think that's kind of his point is that it's it's he's not saying that you should go like once you get rid of these concepts you should just kind of be horrible and start beating grannies up or whatever because that's actually still within the framework of good and evil that's the kind of interesting thing it's his point is you need to transcend that you need to think of what is life affirming or what what actually makes life worth living so it's like if you compare like a strict parent and a super lenient parent like Mm. and there's two children that one child has a strict parent and another has a lenient parent like the child with the lenient parent will tend to like you know explore them explore themselves like more they'll tend to self-actualize they'll tend to mm. pursue whatever interest they want to whilst the child with like strip parents will be limited by their upbringing like would Nietzsche kind of see that parallel would produce that as like a metaphor like a metaphor for Nietzsche's view on morality yeah that's that's actually a good way of thinking about it. I, don't, I don't even have thought considered that analogy before but that, that kind of gets to it it's you need the freedom to explore both sides of the same coin in order to actually push past it and go beyond it because effectively if you continue to live life with a moral framework which is effectively saying act in such a way that you never encounter danger or fear it's like well how is one supposed to live like that you can't live in the hope that eventually you'll be able to be rid of danger or fear because it's not viable life throws danger at you constantly it's something that you need to embrace yeah it's kind of like, it's kind of like um i mean people are always encouraged to like when they're kids like eat dirt or whatever like mm. don't avoid playing in the mud and stuff because when you play in the mud you get a better immune system you become a much healthier human being and like you're less likely to develop like allergies yeah exactly and that's exactly it um and I think in this context, what mud is, is the absence of a universal framework. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, definitely. I like, I like that analogy, so yeah. Um, yeah. I was about to say, though, that um, surely you could create a moral system that kind of like, you know, allows that to happen. So mm. don't violate someone's autonomy. Maybe a sort of like voluntarist or libertarian ethical system could allow for that necessarily like you know soul searching yeah i think so i think conventionally it makes sense but i think nietzsche generally would disregard systems i Mm -hmm. think is hang on i'll see if i can find it i've got like all my nietzsche books just right by me to like get quotes ready you know i was 
I was gonna I was gonna write quotes out last night, but then I kind of was like, oh, I don't like copying <laughs> stuff out. <laughs> so I just kind of remembered the one fun. Uh, where is it? Uh, I can't remember where it is now. Uh, yeah, this is it. Um, I mistrust all systemist. <laughs> I mistrust all systematists and avoid them. The will to system is a lack of integrity. So I think what he means by that there is. What, what a system effectively does is like, if you remember what we were saying about how he regards a word as a metaphor, mm-hmm. I think he thinks any system in of itself is basically built off these concepts, which are in, um, in of themselves metaphors, because how can you develop a concept without using language? And I think the point there is with morality is there is never going to be one circumstance where one moral dictum will be equally applicable to absolutely every circumstance. I think that's kind of how he would see it. It's, yeah you still need that gray area in order to, to be able to push past because these effectively what they do is one, the moment you assign these limitations through language and create these moral laws for yourself, what you're basically doing is limiting possibilities that can occur that might actually enlighten you or might, how should we say, enriching the human experience of, mm-hmm. of life. But it's, it's a weird one to be fair. I, I, it's the will to power and his view of morality is one that I not necessarily avoid talking about but one that when I talk about I have to be very careful how I explain it because it's it is tricky it, it does sound you know I don't want to say like to the common ear but it does sound in just general speak he's basically saying uh oh, anarchy just fuck everything up and just do what you want which is kind of like uh, it's, it's half like that but it's a bit more complicated than that I'm a little confused about like what Nietzsche understands us to be like mm. he said that he sees reality as kind of like a universal becoming. Mm. So that universal becoming, there isn't really any static thing mm. that we would be. So like because like you know, you remember how I was talking about that essay that I wrote about after them in the world and stuff. Yeah. I made a point in that essay because I was ultimately the, the point that I was making was that in order to get rid of suffering, you have to totally affirm the world. And by totally affirming the world, you collapse the distinction between the world and yourself. Mm. So, the world can no longer cause you suffering because you and the world are the same thing. Yeah. So you can't anymore suffer the world because it's yourself. So I gave this example about a schizophrenic where like, I mean, it was kind of tongue in cheek, you know, I'm not being entirely serious, but like, so a schizophrenic, he has voices inside the head, but like ordinary people hear voices inside the head all the time, but we mm-hmm. call them our own thoughts and our own voice. So maybe the difference between a schizophrenic and an ordinary person is that, we identify the thoughts as ours, whereas the schizophrenic defines those thoughts as other. And so those thoughts are intruding into their own head. So, and by defining the thoughts as ours, we take them into ourselves, and we, mm. that part of the world becomes us. So like, to what extent can you take that? Can you take the entire world through affirming the world? Can you take the entire world as yourself? And so like, yeah. how you respond to that? Yeah, I, thought, I think that's, it's this is what I mean. I think what I was going to say is I've noticed with a lot of thinkers, like the existentialist thinkers that I've come across, at least, is the barking up the right spiritual tree and then don't really climb the whole way to realize like a perspective of non duality. Because, with just to go off slightly off topic, with Sartre, his like in the being, being a nothingness, he, he attempts to be rid of the subject object distinction through language but then never really goes any further well to think of the implications of it but i know that nietzsche himself talks about how the identity the ego is in of itself a concept which we've invented and he he actually in a few of the texts that i've come across by nietzsche in twilight of the idols and beyond good and evil that i can recall he's basically saying this this ego this i that we identify with and understand ourselves with where does it come from what is this ego like is it a fixed thing that i can find because it it doesn't seem like that to me so it it definitely does seem like it's interesting because he's quite critical of stoicism as well and i think if you read marcus aurelius marcus aurelius talks about this sort of natural way of the whole he calls it the whole with a capital w and um it's basically his metaphor for God, but his, his whole worldview is basically that if you like act in accordance with the whole, you, you basically won't suffer because how could you suffer if you are literally just basically letting yourself be carried along with the natural 
how should we say, natural flow of, of nature. So I'm not, I'm not too sure what Nietzsche would say to that, to be fair, because I don't think... He does deny the existence of the subject, doesn't he? Like, yeah. I've read quotes by him where it says, like, the ego is just like a phantom that we project, because because if he says that all there is is force, like, all there is are these forces, mm. you can't really separate the force from its manifestation. It's not like there's something here which exerts the force. There's just the force, isn't there? So there's no, like, subject-object distinction in that. Yeah. Like you said, he doesn't really seem to elaborate it and, and explore really the implications of that. Because yeah. the implications of that being that you you are reality itself. You're not like a little fragment, you know. Yeah. But no, just... definitely. I think maybe. I mean, I'm I'm putting words into his mouth now, or at least trying to think of how he would think about this. Is I think he would perhaps be wary of going into a non-dualistic framework in the sense that it might have religious connotations or he, he wants to veer away from the idea of God or something magical. I think his viewpoint is more naturalistic. It does seem to satisfy the requirements of his, um, of his thing though. Right? Like it's not a true world yeah. because it's making, it, it's, it's making this world into God, isn't it? It's not elevating some kind of theoretical transcendent world over the top which mm. we have to attain to. It's like the same Buddhism. Because I think that Nietzsche misinterprets like a lot of Eastern religions, you know, because he says, yeah. that, he says, for instance, with Christianity, like the Christians are putting God and heaven above this world and then they're trying to get to that next world and, and then diminishing and spitting on the world that they're actually living in. Mm. And I think that he says the same thing about Eastern religions where it's like you have to gain enlightenment and transcend and detach yourself from that world. But I think that yeah. there's a, I think that there's a subtler interpretation of Eastern religions where, like for instance, the same Buddhism, samsara and nirvana are the same thing. Like mm. nirvana, the absolute bliss, and samsara, the everyday world, are the same. You know, because uh, it's like you were saying about non-duality. There's no real difference. So, like mm. the ultimate liberation from the world is not to realize that there really isn't the world. It's just all Brahman. You know, it's all yeah. It's all the... Well, yeah. It's, it's to refer back to a point I was saying earlier. I think the texts that he had access to that went into detail with Buddhism were perhaps not the best. I don't think he was working with the best source material because I think his understanding of Buddhism at that time would have been more sort of, I've, I've read about how Alan Watts describes it is throughout history in, in China, Buddhism effectively became a way to punish like unruly young boys. So they sent them to a monastery so they could be taught how to sort of meditate and calm down and sort of behave properly so i think he still has this kind of how should we say dogmatic religious implication that he he gets from buddhism which is not necessarily the more bare bones sort of spiritual ideas that kind of underlie it as a because the main branch of buddhism isn't it it's it's pure land buddhism where it's like um you have, you have like the this is what like the, the Buddhism that most people in China and stuff believe, where it's like you, you say the name of the Buddha, Mida Buds, and by saying the name of the Buddha, you get reborn into the pure land of, of the celestial Buddha. Mm. So all you need to do is go to Mida Buds and you get reborn, which is kind of Christian esque. Yeah, it's very Christian esque. Yeah. The central teaching is it, it hasn't got really anything to do with that at all. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, I, th I think this is honestly, this is why I kind of veer away from ever describing myself as a religious person because I think the issue with religion and I think it's, it's perhaps even what Nietzsche would identify as the, the issue with religion is in creating this system to live your life by you're basically just kind of like how should we say it's a limitation it's basically trying it's it's kind of like saying this is my way of thinking and any other way of thinking is wrong whereas there is no right way of thinking so I think that's yeah I think it's 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 a shame perhaps that Nietzsche isn't alive today where he can read about Taoism in more depth. Because I, I genuinely do think this. I think it's it's something I've considered doing my dissertation on is the amount of overwhelming similarities there are between Nietzsche and spirit, spiritual truths. But even like even like a lot of like existential essentialist thinkers and I think I think what's interesting is if you think of what Nietzsche meant for philosophy, where you kind of it's it's the it's how should we say it's going from rationality into like sort of an era more of consciousness because of phenomenology, 
it's you see how Nietzsche actually influences like phenomenology and postmodernism and existentialism, which comes after him, which all kind of are rooted in what Nietzsche's talking about in his text, which at the same time are very, how should we say, very linked to spiritual ideas in the East, or like not not linked as such, but they bear much similarity towards them. So that's why even when you see like people like Derrida talking about like deconstruction which is basically just like trying to deconstruct any narrative that you have about the world and the, the understanding that these narratives are built off fluid concepts. It's, it's, it's all Buddhist is like really Buddhist, to be honest. Like, Wait, do you think yeah. though, that um, this shift from rationality to a more spiritual Buddhist, like, you know, subjectivist view of the world, do you think it could be like, like the way we shift into like a different like era of like political thoughts or like, Rationality mm. was, you know, what capitalism was built on. So you think the next like phase of, you know, society could be this new Buddhist spiritual, like, you know, outlook? Mm. I'm not too sure because I'd think, because I think with Nietzsche, it's not necessarily, and, and it is, it's, it could be argued as spiritual. I don't think that's necessarily what he was going for, but he does basically, a lot of what he's talking about is basically trying to enrich the individual. But in terms of how that relates to politics, I'm not too sure because I'm not too sure whether having a subjectivist understanding of the world and integrating that into politics, I'm not too sure whether or not that would actually have a good or bad influence because I think if you bring it back to the individual too much then you can end up just with a society that's segregated and sort of like a like a neoliberal hell if we might describe it as that sorry were you gonna say something no no oh sorry i thought you were i was was gonna say uh, i think that the problem with that eastern thing is that and you know how you were saying like there's like um you can you can sense Eastern ideas in Nietzsche's thought. Mm. The problem with a lot of these philosophers is that is that they identify themselves with the body on like a subconscious level. Mm. You know, so like pre-rational, they have this kind of really strong self-identification with the body that prevents them from seeing the implications of their own philosophy almost. Yeah. You know, that isn't really rational, that, that they can't really explain because in our culture, we'll have that beaten into it from childhood, like you are the body, you are the body, you are the body. Yeah. And that belief is so woven into our kind of psyche on such a fundamental level that it's really hard to extricate yourself from it. And that's mm-hmm. what prevents them from seeing the implications of what they're actually saying. Yeah, I agree with you on that because I think it's almost a presupposition that is ingrained into us without even realizing that we are this body that is distinct, pardon me, that is distinct from the world around us. I think that's I think that's one thing I don't really like about Sartre too much because Sartre's goal is effectively, and I think it's a little bit of Heidegger as well, but I've not read Heidegger, so I can't really comment on on what he's actually arguing. But the thing with Sartre is he's trying to define the individual in the absence of God. And it's the way I sort of see it is, uh, do you really need to define the individual? Oh, because the thing is what he's actually talking about, Sartre, when he, when he says that basically what you fundamentally are is nothingness. You are like this empty space in which reality sort of fills itself into. And it, it's you who, in that process, retroactively looks on that process and thinks, oh, that, that must be what I am. It's what he's saying there is effectively, if, if he basically had the understanding that what that process is, is consciousness, if we might refer to it as that. He's basically just describing like Hinduism. It's basically like, like you are just like this empty space in which your perception exists. That's, that's why perception exists, because in the infinite stuff, there, there are these empty spaces which you occupy that's basically what perception is but it's yeah i think it's kind of um i think i think what the future of philosophy should look towards broadly speaking is a global integration of all philosophical ideas so it's basically like instead of it being like oh this is the western sort of nomenclature and this is the eastern way of thinking we combine them or not necessarily combine them but we Oh, hang on a minute, I'm being called by my family. Yeah. We can pause the recording. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's all right now. Um, all right, okay, thanks. Uh, sorry about that. I think I does go there to a certain extent. I, I'm not like an expert on Heidegger, but like I think 
when he uses the word Dasein, like I think what he means is like the because it means like being there, like yeah. he's away from like the subject object distinction, like the distinction between the body and the world, maybe like being there is like the the world itself and like you like mm. interpret that world in a certain way. Then that's what constitutes like your, your own individual subjectivity or something. I mean, I'm not yeah, no. years trying to get away from that. I think, yeah, that's the thing. I think it's from what I can understand from not having really read them thoroughly is there is this idea that you're trying to redefine the individual in the absence of a shared underlying, like basically you're trying to find what's common to the individual. Cause if, if what's no, if what's common is no longer God or morality and all these things, one has to ask themselves, well, what is this common thing? And I think that's what Sartre and Heidegger were trying to do. And that's why for Heidegger, he thought it was how, I think it's how we understand ourselves in relation to death. I think that's why I think it's his book being a time where he basically, I like, I, like I said, I haven't read any Heidegger, but I think it's basically you exist in the world and you understand yourself constantly in relation to the future. And then for Sartre, it's like, no, you're actually like this nothingness. Mm. It's more like a phenomenological way of looking at reality. But then again, I don't really know much about Sartre and Heidegger, so I can't really say. But yeah, I think I think it's basically, it, I think there is a problem in the, trying to define the individual in any way at all. And they're stuck halfway between the, the consciousness thing and the individual body thing. Mm. Wait, can you repeat that? Sorry. That they're stuck halfway between seeing themselves as like consciousness, like you said with Sartre, where you are this empty space in which everything appears. Mm. They're also kind of clinging to this old idea of like you are the body and trying to like understand you know mm. i think well I, in my opinion they need to let go of the idea that you are just like this one individual body yeah mm. no i 100 percent agree with that but that, i think that ties in a lot to my sort of personal spiritual views as well because i feel like these elaborate. are like... elaborate on that like i want to hear your own put like personal spiritual views like how they relate uh, I don't have like I don't have a framework. I don't have like a sort of set way of thinking. But I think, from my understanding, it's like what me and Harry have been just talking about here is, it does appear that personal identity is something that's somewhat illusory. It's, it's how should we say, it's convenient to understand yourself as a body, mm-hmm. and as a particular entity that is conscious of the world around you. But if you push past that understanding and start to think perhaps that what's actually going on here is you are a manifestation of reality itself. And so you're actually made made out of this world and are this world as much as everything around you is. It, how should we say, it's quite liberating really mm-hmm. because it makes you realize that you're part of something so much greater. Like, um, I was about to say though, um... <clears throat> something I really want to touch on was how even though Nietzsche's philosophy seems to be against the concept of the ego, mm. a lot of interpretations have lent themselves to very ego-fulfilling ideas, such as like, you know, Nazism. Mm. Like, how would you explain that? Um, well, from what I understand, the whole link between the uber-mentioned Nietzschean philosophy and Nazism comes from his sister, who is a fascist, and her sister, who basically when Nietzsche, Nietzsche for like the last few years of his life was was hospital, hospitalized because he mm-hmm. lost his mind. Um, in that period, basically what his sister did was compiled all his notes into this book called The Will to Power and then kind of twisted it in such a way that kind of supported her fascist rhetoric. But the funny thing is Nietzsche, actually in Beyond Good and Evil, I think I highlighted it, um, is talking about how idiotic it is to be an anti-Semite. He's talking about like how fundamentally how should we say how fundamentally flawed that line of thought actually is to have like a a racist view or like a kind of xenophobic view on a certain group of people i i just find that fascinating like i remember when i read that i just thought i've heard nietzsche linked with nazism so many times and they clearly just haven't even read his books you know what i mean yeah because i think he fell out with wagner i think over that like i think the yeah. famous composer wagner was like a massive anti-semite and then Nietzsche was like, fuck that, and then just <laughs> cut him out of his life. Yeah, more or less. I know because he greatly respected Wagner for years, but eventually fell out with him because I think basically because Nietzsche is vehemently opposed to nationalism as a concept. Mm-hmm. He thinks nationalism is, like I said, um, 
Bullshit. What's up? Bullshit. Yeah, basically. Well, because this this concept of national identity, he's sort of like, well, what is this thing? Like, I mean, in a way, it's kind of like its own little restricting system. It's kind of like its own little thing that allows certain people to not self actualize because like when you're under the influence of like an anti-Semitic regime or whatever, mm. then if you're Jewish, you can't really self actualize Like you have to be focused on like, you know, dealing with anti-Semitism. Yeah, no, 100%. It's, yeah, because I think the thing is Nietzsche's, the way he writes is very, how should we say? Metaphorical? There's that, but what I'm trying to say is he writes like a bit of a dick, basically. Mm-hmm. And I think because of that throughout history, he's been interpreted as somewhat of a bigot. I don't think that's really true. There are some things he says that are questionable. Like he says a lot of stuff about women. That's a bit like, oh, I uh, don't know whether I agree with that. But that's also because I think if you understand the concept of like in the context of the fact that in his time, um, he was like desperately in love with this woman and she was like a Christian and was like, was like against sex. He was clearly just gagging for a shag and was like, oh, stupid women. Just they'll just let themselves chill out. Stop being Christian, like have a shag. They'll feel so much better. <laughs> but <laughs> Like that that's just my own interpretation at least. But he does say that leads into um when he called I think he criticized Kant for being sexually frustrated or something, and <laughs> that was the basis on his philosophy. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't um I wouldn't disagree with that, you know. I think that's there is something to that. And in a way the Ubermensch was kind of like, you know, a little bit of self like projection because <laughs> his actual existence was pretty sad, honestly. Like yeah, he was this loser who was chasing the same woman for like ten years or whatever, and he tried yeah. to imagine himself as this great Ubermensch, this self-actualizing man. When in reality, he was just, <laughs> it's just yeah. a sad little. Well, to be honest, you know what? I actually there are some aspects of Nietzsche's life that are certainly a bit. You wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily want to live your life in some ways that he did, like constantly chasing one woman or whatever but you know what I actually do think to myself I wouldn't mind having a life like his where he gets to this point where he basically spends his time walking through the mountains in like Switzerland like near Zurich and just thinking of like great ideas it's like if I could live a life like that I would be sorted out I don't, that, like that that's all I really want it's just like yeah just let me walk around in nature and write masterpieces <laughs> it's like guess yeah, so <laughs> Like what we need to do is um get all the make a ton of money so you have infinite financial security. Then just mm-hmm. spend your days just walking around, think of our ideas and like discussing them or whatever. Yeah, well, I think that's basically what happened to him because he like he had a really successful academic career at a very young age and he had poor health. So I think he received this fat pension, which basically meant he could just like spend all this time working on his on his books. But because there's a there's like you see his philosophy progressed as he like writes more texts which is the mad thing and it it what i've always noticed is there's a definite sense of increasing lunacy throughout his work mm-hmm. but in a really not in a like in a derogatory sense it's his work becomes a lot more what's the word i'm looking for i don't want to say psychotic erratic perhaps no i don't think that's the right word um, creative but, Creative is certainly one of them. It becomes a lot more, how should we say, bizarre. Mm-hmm. It's like his last book, um, Eke Homo, is an autobiography that he wrote. But it's it's a baffling text. It's some of the chapter titles in it are, are fascinating, like why I am so great and why I write <laughs> great books and all this sort of stuff. And I think he really viewed himself as the, the saviour of philosophy at the time but he also realized or like at least he thought of himself as so he realized that nobody would really be willing to listen to him for what he was trying to tell them so i think that's why he just basically and that coupled with the fact he was probably always on his own and didn't have much company he probably just got into this state of not paranoia but just basically like I know myself when I don't talk to people for weeks I get a little bit trapped in my own head and start thinking crazy bollocks so I think he probably actually 
I, I definitely think there is an influence on his psychology. Like you can definitely see how his personal life influences philosophy. But this is funny though, because this is actually what Nietzsche says about other philosophers. Yeah, like I mentioned about Kant before, like yeah. Kant being sexually frustrated was <laughs> at the basis for his, was it his morality or? Um, I don't really know to be honest. I've only read the groundwork, the groundworks for morality, whatever it's called by Kant. I've not read anything else. But um, from what I can gather from Kant, I mean, I don't know. I've heard things like I heard somebody, you know, Seb, who's on our course. I think he, so. I'm not too sure. Is he? What? 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 No, I'm not too sure who Seb is. Like, I haven't. Oh, you know, he's like, he's like, he's like um, I'm trying to think how to describe him. He always wears cool clothes and like mm-hmm. has like a distinctive face mark, like birthmark. Oh, yeah, mark. yeah, that guy. Um, he was telling me he heard this story about Nietzsche were or a can sorry were. Somebody basically, Kant was in conversation, like in the middle of a conversation with somebody in his like house, and then someone comes over to him, like his butler or whatever, and says, "Oh, Kant, Mister Kant, it's like ten p.m." and he just stops talking immediately and just like gets up and goes and just lies in his bed, fully clothed, and just goes to sleep instantly. So, <laughs> I think the thing with, you know what though, this is I think this is a thing with a lot of great thinkers, is there's definitely like maybe like some sort of like autism. Mm-hmm. or some underlying sort of like they're definitely on the spectrum in some way and that's kind of why they're so clever is because they kind of view reality in like some mad way that like most normal folk if you if if we must refer to them as such can't really understand or get behind that line of reasoning like i think Kant and Vic, like people like Kant and wittgenstein like certainly because mm. they just viewed the world in an entirely different way and they just had their own idiosyncrasies yeah yeah, no, definitely, definitely did. I know um, there's definitely there, there definitely is something to um, the mm-hmm. psychology of philosophers though, and like how they approach the world. It's it's always funny when philosophers criticize one another as well. Like I know this is slightly off topic, but I know Schopenhauer referred to Hegel as a flat-headed, insipid <laughs> charlatan who is just basically prophesizing a load of nonsense to a bunch of like vulnerable, susceptible like students <laughs> so yeah it's like definitely is something to the psychology of the philosopher that worried us a bit when you said that because um like about can't go into bed because i always go to bed at the same time you know i was <laughs> exactly the same time wake up at exactly yeah. the same time you know? no that's it's the responsible way to be i i when i'm not sleeping like when i'm not going to sleep at seven in the morning which is basically kind of what i'm doing at the minute um i normally try and go to bed at like 11 p.m so i normally set an alarm for 10 30 and then that's just like chill out and read for a bit or you know whatever but yeah i really hope that three o'clock in the morning will be the philosopher's like sleeping like schedule or whatever uh-huh. well you know what i i this is the annoying thing i find i'm most productive late at night or early in the morning when everyone else is asleep it's it's mm-hmm. an absolute pain in the ass because like the world we live in or society that we live in is constructed for people who wake up at like seven in the morning or six in the morning and like get up and like drink a coffee and commute and they're like yeah let's go on whereas me it it takes me about four hours to wake up yeah, I hate like, like I hate being spoken to in the morning. It's just like, listen, I'm like I'm like an old computer that's like just <laughs> give it a bit of time. The fan will go for like half an hour. Then once it kind of settles, it'll be fine. But I mean, <laughs> I guess in a way, like I mean, all great thinkers, rather than that just being their time, they they just have a completely different time to the normal web. So like, if the norm was like you know, gets going to sleep at three o'clock in the morning and taking four hours to get up, then like surely like the great thinkers or whatever like the the people who go against the grain would have mm. the normal sleep time or Perhaps. Have the normal schedule well i i'm willing to bet that there are many people many creative geniuses who have worked within a framework of getting up at six in the morning and going to sleep around about mm-hmm. 11 i just think that there's a there's a certain sort of link between neuroticism and creativity i think and i'm saying this as someone who you know plays music and enjoys writing there is something to just how should we say it's 
Well, I think those states of mind provoke spontaneity. And I think it's in spontaneity where you find your greatest creative ability. Like, um, in a way, I kind of see a little parallel between the way people like philosophers operate and the way businessmen operate. So businessmen will have a lot more of um, a structured sleep schedule. It will appear a lot more like healthy, but philosophers will have a lot more of a neurotic sleep schedule. Mm. So, well, so. like I say, I don't know what a... Yeah, maybe. Maybe great philosophers and whatnot. But then again, if, you, if you're thinking about the majority of philosophers that we cover on our course are basically mm-hmm. like, like, how should we say, like privileged, mm-hmm. like, like they're basically more or less aristocracy in the sense we're talking about like the historical eras that we're covering. So these people are probably just like, how should we say, equivalent to like lords and whatnot in, mm-hmm. in our culture today, except they're just like their whole life is dedicated to just being dead clever and like writing mad shit. Well, have you got any more questions, Aram, about uh, about anything? No, I haven't. But um, we can certainly continue this like long discussion. Like, mm. it's just about to say one. <clears throat> I don't know. I guess it feeds to like you know different types of intelligence. So there's like a business type of intelligence where it's like about managing a system, um, like coming to terms with like you know how to improve your profit margins. Whereas a philosopher's intelligence might be more due to like random eureka moments or just moments of like, you know, moments of clarity in a way, which I feel come more through bursts of thought at three o'clock in the morning. Mm. Well, yeah, I know with me is I sometimes just have those eureka moments where I need to write everything down because it's like, Jesus, that's like really clear. But I get a lot of that through meditation as well. Mm -hmm. Meditating can invoke that because effectively what you're doing is when you're creating the separation between you and your thoughts or just basically becoming aware of the thoughts that are in your mind um it's it's somehow given that space just allows for nat- the most naturally occurring best thoughts to arise like i find a lot of times when i'm when i have a problem and i meditate sometimes just the, the solution will come to my head without me even trying to force it it's just through like trying to like basically allow myself to become present and aware. It's just like it just shoots into my mind and so I'm like, oh, there it was. But yeah, I think I think there is certainly something to I think intelligence is a I think it's people don't respect intelligence enough as something that is entirely diverse. Like I think when somebody thinks of intelligence, they think of somebody who's book smart, perhaps, or someone who's eloquent. But I think intelligence basically it basically extends to anybody who does anything well. In, in a way, that's very Nietzschean. Like that, yeah. that diversity of intelligence shows that Nietzsche's philosophy is probably one of the best ways of, you know, actually having. I know it's not a system, but let's just call it that for the sake of argument. But it's mm. probably the best system for, you know, the diversity of our intelligence because yeah. when we try and actually create a system of morality or a system of philosophy it's always gonna you know be more <clears throat> prone to supporting certain types of intelligence so some mm-hmm. systems of morality might be you know <clears throat> better for serving the more book smart people for yeah example. yeah no definitely i think i think that would be conducive to that in mm-hmm. a sense because i think i think that one of the things i like about reading nietzsche is how he he basically mocks philosophers <laughs> prior to him for taking it so seriously i think that's one of the things i really like about nietzsche's literary style is how just quite frankly how funny it is at times like he's, he's he does just insult people and just call people stupid <laughs> and it's, it's, like i think like that, that that's regarded as fallacious you know that, that would be regarded as fallacious by a logician but i i think that sort of rhetoric is it's funny it it because i think what nietzsche does through his writing is he tries not to engage you purely conceptually or intellectually mm-hmm. in such as like ah oh, he thinks this because of that he tries to get you to experience it on an intuitive and emotional level now that's that's how mm-hmm. i understand a lot of his stuff is from when i read a certain passage and it, it, it amuses me or sort of makes me oh yeah oh, that's that's really that's really interesting it, it sort of it clicks with me on like a deeper level and just like oh okay so because 
okay, so because there are, there's only numinal and phenomenal and blah, blah, blah. And it's like really like, ah. Oh. So it's like, um, it's kind of like it would be a lot easier to have a conversation with Nietzsche about his philosophy. Like the way Ooh. he explains it, it's more like he's talking to you or whatever. Like it's like he would talk in real life. I it would be any easier, actually. I, I think it, it's... I know some of the tutors in our course have said this before. They say the thing with reading Nietzsche is it's deceptively easy because it's it reads so nicely that you might not actually take it, take all of it in. But I think the thing with Nietzsche is it may be not easy, but certainly more interesting. I think that's the, the crucial difference. Because I think what he's talking about is really complicated. It's really, it's, it, 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 like I've been reading him for a couple of years now and it's I, I'm there's still a lot I don't understand with his particular way of thinking it's stuff that i need to read more into and reread to properly digest and internalize but it's see i've always thought that the best way to express philosophical ideas is through literary form or through art like film because particularly like i don't know have you ever read dostoevsky i've not read him but i i absolutely need to like it's just it's something on my reading list but i just haven't got around to it yeah because Dostoevsky actually influenced Nietzsche quite a lot. And if you read notes from the underground, the the first half of that text is effectively like reading Nietzsche because it's just like aphorisms and just discussing like philosophical ideas. Like he talks a lot about like free will and how he talks about the metaphor of the stone wall. And what the stone wall is, it's the limitations that you put on on existence through trying to describe existence through laws or like the, the laws of nature and he thinks that effectively like you, you come to the stone wall and his his point in the notes from the underground is like i i can put like i can push past this wall with my own volition if i wish like he talks about like how um you can say two plus two equals four but if i really dare say it i can always say that two plus two equals five and there's nothing you can do about that just because i want to say the two plus two equals five but the, the thing is when you read dostoevsky um and um, Franz Kafka is another one I've been reading recently. Mm-hmm. The, the thing is, they're discussing philosophical ideas, but in a way that's not so dry, but in a narrative form. I think it sticks with you better than... I know I, particularly I really like watching films for getting into philosophical ideas as well. Like Certainly. Tarkovsky is really good for that. Really? Yeah, because the thing with Tarkovsky is his films are like generally quite long and quite... They're, they're, they're slowly paced but what they normally do is they present philosophical ideas to you through the the story in a relatively abstract form that means that you can sort of how should we say implant your own understanding of the film onto it it's like someone described it as like a, a philosophical Rorschach test mm-hmm. which is an interesting way to put it but yeah because this films deal with a lot of philosophical themes and like his his narratives are normally based around sort of abstract concepts but it's the thing is this is what i think the important part is is when you're engaging with it is it's it's interesting it's entertaining and i think that's what like i think nietzsche basically talks a lot about this is how like like what what's the point in writing something if it's not going to be fun or interesting to read yeah because like i mean especially for me like my first introduction to philosophy or even debating was through fictional series like my first introduction to any thought like any sort of like intellectual thought was um marvel's civil war like there's um, a comparison between captain america's ideology of like freedom and stuff and iron man's ideology of um you know security and protecting like people by restricting um the mm. superheroes with like the superhuman registration act or whatever like right. I mean, <clears throat> like, honestly, like, I do feel that art is probably the best way to introduce people to philosophy. Of course, because I think that's the thing with philosophy is, I've said this to a few of my friends and family and whatnot, talking about philosophy before, is I say to them that we are all philosophers. Yeah. Because we all have ideas about the world. And it's like, perhaps, you know, perhaps you don't spend hours meticulously refining them into a, like a coherent worldview, but you still do have 
natural intuitions about how the world should work and i think that's basically that's where philosophy came from is when when we got past the point of needing to like you know hunt wild boars to survive and we had an organized society we started to think hang on a minute what the fuck's the point in all this and is that that's, that's literally it it's... literally that's yeah. the message of this podcast by the way like anyone watching right now um you can be a philosopher like um <clears throat> you don't have to be some crazy academic who's constantly just reading up on like the latest new philosophers or whatever, you, you can do it just through like thinking of your own ideas of how the universe came about. So for example, I used to think that, oh, um, what if nothing is real? What if everyone around me is a figment of my imagination? Kind of like mm. just skeptical thoughts. Like I feel everything starts with skepticism when it comes to philosophy. Yeah, I think, well, it, it comes from questioning and inquiry. Like I know myself mm-hmm. when I was a kid, I had this idea. It's, a little bit similar to yours, but not as radical, perhaps. I thought to myself, how can I be sure that what everybody else is perceiving is the same as what I'm perceiving? Because it, it could be that they understand the world the same way as me, but what yeah. they're perceiving might just be loads of, like, beeps and, like, dots on a screen, whereas what I perceive is, like, a book with, like, words in it. Another person might just, like, perceive, like, something beyond my comprehension. I remember thinking that when I was nine, and I was like, oh, that's probably just a load of bollocks. <laughs> that's philosophy of mind basically like yeah, no, yeah qualia kind of like i think it's like qualia yeah. is subjective so if you do philosophy of mind at all like you'll see that um there's theories about how we perceive the world like mm. kind of like that yeah no exactly it's um because i think what i was thinking as a little kid was the idea that we experience the same thing but the way it presents itself to us is different mm-hmm. so as a as like i might look at you as a human being but you, how you perceive reality might just be like when i'm looking at you you might understand it in a completely different way and i always thought to myself maybe when you get people that are like how should we say oh, I'm trying to it's a psychotic yeah that that sort of thing maybe what it is is the way they perceive the world is so radically different to us that to, to us we kind of like well what, what what's what's your problem like why do you mm-hmm. perceive it this way but if we actually switched into their their first world perspective it would probably be for i mean given this premise it would be so radically different that we wouldn't at first understand what it is i think i heard there's a theory that um schizophrenia isn't a mental disorder it's more like a different way of looking at the world so and also i think i heard another theory that schizophrenics are the people who see the world in its like clearest form Mm. well i'm on to Terence McKenna talks about shamanism and it's linked with schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. It talks about like the invisible landscape, which is basically like what that way of thinking when you have schizophrenia allows you to access this mm-hmm. invisible landscape, which is kind of like, how should we say a higher reality? But um, yeah, I think it's, I think that's basically how we should treat mental illness in general though. It's like, instead mm-hmm. of seeing it as like, oh, this is something that's wrong with you. You don't see the world properly. It's just kind of like trying to integrate it and realize that like perception is fluid and there's no right way to see the world. Like I always think it's like, what's what's a mentally healthy person? What's a normal person? Cause surely that mentally healthy person at some times is like, ah, oh, I can't be fucked. Everything's like rubbish and gets a bit pessimistic. Like if somebody's always optimistic and it's always like oh come on guys let's let's go out and smash the day they're they're running away from something i guarantee it like um i was kind of like that when i was like there were times in my life where i was like overly optimistic about everything mm. and that was just me running away from my issues and in addition yeah. like what most people would probably regard as like the mentally healthy person is probably addicted to coffee and like mm. pills or whatever exactly so that's why i know i th- see you know what you know what's really annoying is how little philosophy i've actually read because yeah. i've heard i've heard thingy um is it foucault he talks a bit about how like in ancient times we like mentally ill people or like people who had like uh, who had schizophrenia or whatever mm-hmm. they would kind of just be left to their own accord and it, people would laugh at them and go oh, what the fuck's wrong with them but they'd still just let them do their own thing whereas now what we do is we try and cure them and we put them mm-hmm. in a mental hospital and give them pills it's like <clears throat> your way of seeing the world is wrong we we must like craft you into a normal person who sees the world like us yeah 
like I feel the best way, a really good way to deal with like these schizophrenics would be like um, kind of like a trip sitter because like just someone always there to make sure that oh don't don't cross the road at a bad time or whatever, don't mm. step in front of a train, like don't well, do something crazy. I've spoken to a few people before with schizophrenia, and really? what I'm no- yeah yeah, and what I've noticed is <clears throat> the issue isn't necessarily hearing the voices; it's it's what the voices are telling you. Mm-hmm. So it's when it's when you're a schizophrenic and then the voices start saying to you like oh like no one like everyone's out to get you you got to kill yourself or like you've got to kill mm-hmm. others that's that's the problem because that's when you start to sort of get paranoid it's i think it's paranoid schizophrenia is like the kind of one that's more likely to lead to like someone harming themselves or others mm-hmm. but in general like people can be schizophrenic and just like hear the voices and just be like, oh yeah it's just it's just they're there <laughs> Yeah, like I just feel like it would be way better to de- like to deal with schizophrenics like and not a like hey we need to save you from your self kind of way more as like a guardian kind of like we could like rather than like some sort of um restrictive like <clears throat> I don't know authoritarian parent you should be more like a friend saying hey uh, maybe don't do that maybe don't wander out too far do you get what mm. I'm saying well, that's the thing. In the Amazon, people that are schizophrenic are like elevated to positions of great reverence, where they mm-hmm. like they hold rituals that are like crucial to their lifestyle, like ayahuasca rituals. Yeah, exactly. Like the shamanic rituals of like the ayahuasca um, mm-hmm. rituals that are basically like these great spiritual events. The the people that are in charge of these are people that in in more westernized culture we would regard as schizophrenic so Mm -hmm. it's just perspective in it it's like i was saying before it's it's, it's all just perspective i think we were planning to do a podcast about uh, psychedelics and shamanism in the future with rob all right do you guys want to cut the podcast short there because we're getting a bit off topic i mean we can continue (laughs) this conversation uh uh you know outside the podcast but maybe we should cut it off there because i think yeah sure that's that's fair (laughs) can i do that we could discuss for hours, so I think this is a good place to cut it off. Like, yeah, but um, That's fair enough. Yeah. If you've never, well, Sam, it's it's been brilliant having you, man. Um, hope you can yeah. come on some other time because honestly, you've been a brilliant guest. And I'd be honoured. Peace out. Yeah, thanks very much for having us, guys.